about 45 years ago this summer, I was asked to teach a course in court administration at the National Judicial College. I had just come from a session with the United States Department of Justice in which we were attempting to identify the purpose of each of the divisions. We'd ask the lawyers and the staff members, why do we need your division? What's it, what does it do for the government or for the people of the United States? So when I got to Reno to teach the class, I had the same thing in mind. And so I started asking the judges in classes of 30 what the purposes of courts were. And they answered, and we wrote it down on the blackboard, and we kept track of it, and then at the end of an hour, we sorted it out and made a list of all the purposes that they came up with. So what I'm talking about today are the purposes those judges and court administrators came to in class in small groups over a period of about 10 years. And of course, we've, we've used these many times since then in larger groups. And we've never found anyone who had a substantial difference when they looked at them. So let's talk about them. The first of those is to do individual justice in individual cases. That's quite a mouthful. It's a rather complex idea. Uh, what do we mean by individual? Well, the Constitution of the United States provides for the jurisdiction of courts. They really say there must be a case or controversy. They can't deal abstractly with a proposition put to them. They don't give advisory opinions except under some statutes that have been passed in the last 25 or 30 years. Courts deal with the case before them, and only the case before them, and don't apply, apply the logic beyond that point. So the individual word is important. Uh, cases and controversies is important because it means it's limited to a dispute. Think about that. The adversary system is built into the Constitution. Without an adversary question, we don't have jurisdiction in the courts. The next part of that is to look at justice. People have been arguing since Plato's time about the meaning of justice. Uh, in American courts, I think you can simplify it. It means applying the law to the facts in each individual case. And as a matter of fact, we don't have much trouble with the law. We have multiple methods of appealing a mistake of law. That's what courts of appeals are for. But in fact, the facts are a one-time shot. What the trial court finds about the facts binds the system throughout. And we have trouble with that because we are, strangely enough, a memory-dependent system. Our method for testing whether something is true or false is to cross-examine or confront the witness. Matter of fact, the confrontation's built into the Constitution. So we have this way to identify evidence. Even records kept in the ordinary course of business must be identified by a person who can say, I know that was done properly. And we test it oftentimes by looking at whether it's, it's uh, properly recorded to determine whether it's admissible. It's clearly a memory-dependent system, and we know a lot about memory. First of all, we know that it diminishes with time. There's really no dispute about that. If we were to start today and tell everybody in the room something and ask them to come back tomorrow and tell us what they were told, we'd lose something, wouldn't we? How about waiting 30 days or 60 days or 90 days to tell people about it? But there's something even worse, and that is that the human mind can't stand a vacuum. The human mind fills in the facts it didn't ever see, taste, or smell. 
and it believes those and will test in a, in a lie detector cast on whether they're telling the truth because they believe it's happened. I don't need to dwell on this very much. In a memory dependent system, justice, the very purpose we think of first for courts, can be lost by time. Or to put it differently, time is a justice measure. So when you're keeping track of when something happened and the next event and the next event and you see things put off over and over again in a court, you're really looking at the loss of justice in the system. Well, the next basic purpose of courts is to appear to do justice in individual cases. You think that's the same thing? It's very different because our system is based upon people relying on what courts will do. If courts get it right all of the time, if they get their evidence in a prompt way, if they decide promptly, if people are sentenced in a proper time, the courts appear to do justice. When it's a long period of time between when it starts and when it happens, people lose confidence. This is my proposition. The law works because people trust it to work. You can't litigate every case, not every building that goes up, but the expectation, the trust of the people in the courts determines whether it works. And that appearance of justice, like justice itself, is rapidly lost when the courts delay and drag cases on over long periods of time. Think about that. The next purpose of court is to provide a final resolution of legal disputes. Well, don't they do that by doing justice? No, it's a whole different two-dimensional problem. First of all, we have a value in our system which actually rejects justice on occasions. If I say the word finality to you, those of you who have some legal experience will say res judicata, collateral estoppel. What are those doctrines? They say even if we find evidence to show a, a case was wrong, it was badly decided, we won't open the case. Finality is more important. The final resolution is just as important to many people as the justice itself. Why? So people can get on with their lives. We don't expect things to be litigated for years and years. My short experience in, in Europe and in the countries following the European system would testify that our policy is very important because they can litigate many cases for many years because they don't have the same doctrine of finality. Now the second aspect of providing final resolution has to do with the fact that we enter the government into the enforcement of our judgments. If we didn't have that, if people just got a resolution and then had to go out and fight for the enforcement, we would have the same problem we have. We'd have anarchy. People would take the law into their own hands. They want the surety of law. If they don't get it by a court that enforces its judgments, the final resolution of legal disputes, they will go out and try to do it themselves. Now, the fourth purpose, to protect individuals from the arbitrary use of government power. I know in many of you that conjures up a picture of history. That's what Magna Carta was designed to do, to protect the peers of the realm from the arbitrary king. It's a, it's a basic doctrine of any legal system that isn't dependent upon the whim of people. In our Constitution, we enshrined a whole bunch of ideas like habeas corpus, uh, ex post facto prohibitions, 
due process of law. What was that about? It was to protect the people from the government, from the courts, if you like. You've got to follow these procedures. You've got to, to observe these rights. Congress can't pass a law unless it's specifically authorized. And that's about protecting individuals from the arbitrary use of government power. It may be the one that distinguishes our whole government system most from most of the rest of the world. It means you can't have a dictator because all people are under the law. You could recite, you know, all kinds of things, eminent domain and other areas where this is brought into effect, but it sits very high on the list of important purposes of courts. Well, a fifth one might surprise you. We don't talk about it very much. The fifth one has to do with making a formal record of legal status. Administrators immediately know about this. We spend about 65% of the court budget on making a formal record of legal status. The court reporter taking it down. Uh, the clerks making sure all the papers are in right order. In a sentencing, the judge's recital of the litany that says uh, you, you do this willingly and without any uh, impositions on you to make you do your plea of guilty, which accounts for 95% of all the criminal cases. You see what we're talking about? It's the judicial responsibility and purpose to make that record. People, lives depend on what judges decide or what gets recorded in the court. Think about two big areas of the law, the two highest numbers of cases, traffic and divorce. Almost all of that is about making a record not about deciding what the disposition is going to be. Now the next three of these purposes are based upon the judge's discretionary power in criminal cases. If there were no discretionary power, we may, might not include these. But in all criminal systems, judges exercise discretion, and of course prosecutors do too. So we have in the system a control over that discretion in sentencing. The first of those is uh, to deter criminal behavior. I want to make this a distinction. Deterrence is not about the person in front of the judge for sentencing. Deterrence is about what the rest of the world sees happens to people who are sentenced. Deterrence uh, we used to laugh about when I was in law school. We'd say, there isn't really any deterrence. It, it doesn't work. And then I had a, a good police officer remind me once. He says, well, did you ever get stopped in a speed trap? And of course, you sit there and, well, almost everybody has. Well, why do you slow down the next time you go through? Because you're certain that if you go through there too fast, you're going to get caught and punished. That's a deterrence, isn't it? I had a better illustration some years ago. Uh, I was working on a commission for the United States Internal Revenue Service, and we were talking about how you could legally improve upon on the revenue service's work. And I made some silly statement about, well, deterrence and doesn't really make much difference here. And this old salty special agent in the Revenue Service said, well, in Detroit last year, that's quite a while ago, we convicted two doctors of cheating on their income tax. And it got a lot of publicity in the newspaper. And the next year, we collected 20 million more dollars from the doctors of Detroit than we had the year before. There's deterrence. And deterrence is what judges are thinking about and what the system thinks about when probation officers and other people support that sentencing system. It's a part of the purpose of courts. Now the next purpose the judges and 
administrators came up with was to rehabilitate persons convicted of crimes. Well, some places, they put another deterrence label on that. They call that special deterrence because it's about the person in front of you. But rehabilitation is so much more complex than that. You, you need to look as a judge or probation officer or anybody else working in the system at all the possibilities. You say, well, what's the advantage of sending this person to prison? They'll probably come out a much better criminal, best school for criminals there is. So that's really not our best option for anybody. Then they look at somebody who's never been involved in criminal behavior and they say, well, that's a plus on the side of we can rehabilitate them. Then they study rehabilitation. I'm talking about as a purpose of courts. And they find out that, and a very important fact about time, discovered that if you get people into a rehabilitative program quickly, there's a much lower rate of recidivism than if you take three months or six months or a year to get them in that program. We know that established clearly. So again, when you're thinking about this time, like, like in the other places, becomes a measure of whether you're likely to succeed. Well, we take another step. We say, what do you do when you don't know what to do with somebody who looks like they're going to be in a life of crime? Well, you warehouse them. And that leads to the eighth purpose of courts. The eighth purpose is to separate persons convicted of crime from society. We do warehouse them. Do they commit fewer crimes? No, as a matter of fact, they probably increases the criminal nature of, of our society because they commit the crimes in jail just as well as they did on the outside. We haven't reduced crime, but we've protected society which you could say is one of those purposes that we should add to the whole list. Now, any one of you could probably say there are other dimensions to each one of these purposes. But when you're planning a courthouse or planning for the operations of a court or asking for a budget, you start with these basics and you're going to be way ahead of where you started. The whole evaluation of court administration has to be how did we succeed in managing the courts?